Please remain standing for the arrival of the family and remain standing for our national anthem. Please be seated. Just prior to the beginning of these proceedings, the Prentice family met with Grand Chief Weaselhead of the Blood Tribe. And we will commence today by recognizing that we are on the territorial lands of the Treaty 7 First Nations. Welcome. We have gathered together today to remember and to celebrate the life of Peter Eric James Prentice, Jim. And while today's state memorial is for Jim, he was not the only life that was tragically cut short in the events of two weeks ago. The and the Prentice family is not the only family who have lost a loved one. Our thoughts and prayers are with all those that have been impacted by this terrible accident, and particularly with the families of Ken Galatly, Sheldon Reed, and Jim Crook. Some of those families are here today, and we mourn with you. Their legacies shine as bright as the man who we are here to pay tribute to today. When I met Jim Prentice, he was a wannabe politician 
and I was, a wannabe, I, was, I was a young wannabe politico. In the naivety of youth, I thought I, that I was the one taking a chance on him. Well, of course, we know it was him that took a chance on me. I was charged by his lifelong partner in political crimes, Randy Dawson, with establishing a relationship with the Ottawa Press Gallery for his national leadership campaign. It isn't easy to start that from scratch, and Ottawa can be a tough nut to crack. So as a co cold called journalist, I would simply say, hi, my name is Jason Hatcher, and I would like to talk to you about someone else you don't know. <laughs> Boy, Jim. They sure know who you are now. But today we are not here to remember a politician, but rather a great person, a great Albertan, a great Canadian. Jim Prentice was more than Premier of Alberta, more than a Chief Operating Officer of the country. Jim was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother, an uncle, a friend, and a mentor. Today is about the legacy that he has left us in all of those capacities. I would now like to invite the Black Otter Singers, Herman Yellow Old Woman, Cole Healy, James Black Rider, from the Six Sicka Nation, who will perform an honor song.
Thank you so much. I would now like to ask someone who is not only here in her official capacity, but also as a long time friend of the Prentices. The Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, the Honorable Lois Mitchell. Good morning, everyone. It is my sincere honour to share a few thoughts about our friend Jim, a great Albertan and a great Canadian. The first thing that I think should be mentioned is that my husband and I, Doug, and I think you've already heard that, we were not alone in calling Jim our friend. I think that friendship was something that came easy for Jim because he, was, he always had that ability to see the very best in people around him. He moved through life with sincere gratitude for the many blessings that he had been given and with a very deep appreciation for the gifts and the contributions of others. Jim was at home in every setting and he had the rare ability to talk to anyone about actually any topic. He had that capacity because he truly liked and enjoyed people. He was a trusted and a valued friend, a source of kindness and of thoughtfulness. It was that ability to see the positive, his belief in everything that we can accomplish as individuals, as a province, as a country, and even as North Americans. That shaped how Jim Prentice moved through our world. It also shapes everything he leaves behind. I do mention about North America because Jim had just recently finished the, his, um, at the Canadian Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Centre. He was a uh, amazing role model and he was actually um, called a global fellow. And I heard from many people, many, many people that wrote even to me emails telling me how much, how very much he was respected, he was admired, and he was even really liked in Washington, D.C. When it comes to, to writing, I think the story of, of Jim, a uh, little bit of, of, of Al in Alberta and Canada and even now North America, I believe that historians will describe Jim as a man who rose to great heights in the fields of business and public service and who left a very much a meaningful legacy in both worlds. But I hope those stories will also capture the essence of the man, the spirit that countless people across Alberta, Canada, North America are going to be remembering today. He taught us about courage. He taught us about fortitude in tough times. You know, he showed us what real strength was all about. Despite his many and varied accomplishments, Jim Prentice was first and foremost a very proud husband, a very proud father, and a very proud grandfather. Jim and Karen were great, the greatest of partners. At his 60th birthday, I wrote a short poem about Jim. I thought it was pretty corny, and it was. And Karen actually agreed with me. However, Jim was very amused and touched. She immediately showed it to him by this very simple gesture. So when Karen asked me to speak, she mentioned about the poem. I woke up today remembering that little conversation. So this is for Karen, as corny as it's going to be. He made the very best of his life. He did not give up when there was strife. 
He showed us all how to love and to care. He would not want us to be in despair. We will never forget his life of skill. We feel his presence with us still. Yes, he was taken from us too soon. He still had much to give, but his contributions will endure and his kind and positive ways will live on in the hearts of all of us who are fortunate enough to know him. To Karen, Christina, Cassie and Kate and your families, please know that we are keeping you in our thoughts and our prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Throughout the last two weeks, Karen and the Prentice family have been deeply touched by the support that, they've had, that they have received from across Alberta. I would now like to invite the Premier of Alberta, Premier, Ra Premier Rachel Notley, to come to the stage. Thank you. Well, we are together here today to, to mark what in many ways really is an unspeakable tragedy as the family, the friends and the colleagues of Premier Jim Prentice. We're also here to remember though and to celebrate a remarkable Albertan whose contribution will long benefit every citizen of this province. Of this tragedy, all of us are still struggling to find words that can possibly speak to it. The airplane that doesn't land when it was expected to, the phone call at night. The terrible truth of what happened slowly becoming clear the following day. No family should have to live through this. But we are here today because sometimes they do. And when they do, our first thoughts must always be to the family and to the close friends, as they are today. The people of Alberta are watching us here today, and I know that their sympathy and their solidarity and their gratitude for the life, the remarkable character, and the public service of Premier Prentice are with you. The people of Alberta have much to be grateful for from the public service of Premier Prentice. I'm grateful for the friendly, thoughtful advice he shared with me as I succeeded him as Premier. The people of Alberta will long benefit from his determination to restore our professional public service. He took some very important steps to that end and I'm very honoured to be able to carry that priority forward. Premier Prentice cared passionately about restoring a relationship of respect between the government of Alberta and our province's Indigenous people. Here too, he was being a visionary leader, pointing us to a key priority for both Alberta and Canada as a whole. And Premier Prentice introduced a first version of Alberta's Child Benefit Plan, a generous and important effort to reduce inequality in our province, and one that he's identified as an important priority. I very much regret that our province won't have the benefit of his views and his counsel as we navigate the difficult issues before us. Friends, what does it mean to have when such a dedicated public servant is cut down in the prime of his life? Well, it's a reminder to us all, as I've said before, that every moment that we share with those that we love is a precious gift. It is a reminder to us all in the sometimes rough world of politics to never lose sight of the humanity, the dedication, and the contribution of every colleague. And it is a charge to us all to carry forward the very best of his work. That is exactly what all of us, who were his colleagues in the legislature of the province of Alberta, from every corner of the House, will leave here determined to do. Which will be, I believe, one of the very best ways we can pay lasting tribute to this friendly, thoughtful, talented, dedicated leader 
and brilliant public servant, Premier Jim Prentice. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Notley, and thank you to your office and you personally for the support that you have shown to the Prentice family throughout the last couple of very difficult weeks. To meet Jim Prentice was to meet his family. Family was the center of Jim's life, and family centered his life. It is often missed, the impact on families, when one enters public life. It cannot be understated that Jim's public contributions were made with his family. They shared him with us, which is a tremendous sacrifice, a tremendous gift for any family to make. Jim's daughter, Cassie Apprentice, will now share memories of her father on behalf of the family. Good morning. On behalf of our family, I wish to extend gratitude to all of you for being here today to remember the life of my father, Jim Prentice. In your outpouring of support in recent days, you have so often found the words that fail us as we try to cope with the enormity of our loss as you have stood from coast to coast in observance of moments of silence, you have shared the weight of the emptiness that bears down upon our hearts. My father was so much to so many, and he was absolutely everything to our family. In the beginning, my father was a devoted son and treasured prince to his parents, Wilma and Eric. I pray that my father has today been reunited with his mother and father and that he can know for all eternity the pride that they had in him and all that he accomplished. His life was lived as a pledge to his parents, one of integrity, kindness, hard work, and community. Those principles and the man who embodied them were bedrock to our family. To his sisters, Karen, Joanne, Lori, and Nancy, and their families, he was both middle child and loving center around which we would all so often gather. No matter his public accolades, he was ever Doc Prentice's boy to the extended family who held him dear. This was a man of great humility. To Kate, Christina, and I, Dad was a doting father and an absolute champion. We were each so deeply loved and cherished by our dad, and in turn, we too held him above all others. I idolized my father as a child, but I am grateful also to have had these two short years together as adults, where my admiration only grew. I was always so proud to walk into a room with my father. To sons-in-law, John and Ryan, my father was a dear companion and a silent guide 
in the value he placed on his roles as husband, father, and friend. My dad loved the men his girls loved. To Jack and to Kaylee, my father was a devoted grandfather and an energetic playmate. He wanted the world for his grandchildren and delighted to watch them learn and grow each day. He particularly treasured his moments at the rink, getting Jack ready for hockey practice. Finally, for my mother, Karen. My father was a true partner and best friend. From their first days together, he dreamed of an eventful life dedicated to public service. Through their 33 years of marriage, what he accomplished in life, they accomplished together. My father owed so much to my mother's love and support. And he would often remember fondly the days they were, in his words, poor as church mice, setting out hand in hand to conquer the world. We should all be so lucky to be as loved as my mother was by my father. My father was a deeply thoughtful and generous man. In recent days, so many dear friends and family have described how my father made them feel. Always welcome, always comfortable. His home was open to all, and there were few Prentice gatherings that didn't also include close friends, staff, or colleagues amongst family. My father surrounded himself with people he loved, and he forged enduring relationships of mutual trust and respect. Today, we also mourn the loss of one such friend and family member, my beloved father-in-law, Dr. Ken Galatly. His boundless energy and joy for life found its perfect match in my father. Our family will forever treasure the memories of their laughter together in what we could not have known would be their final days. The tragedy of their passing remains impossible to believe. And today, I find I am still not ready to say goodbye to my father, to our bedrock. But because my father cared so deeply about this country, this province, and the people in it, we know that we do not grieve alone. Broken and shattered, we must all today stand tall on the foundations that he laid. Integrity, kindness, hard work, and community, but most importantly, the love of family. Thank you.
Thank you, Laura. That was truly beautiful. Cassia, your dad would be so proud of you. It has been striking over the last two weeks to see and hear from the many friends that Jim made throughout his life. He touched so many people, and each person who got to know Jim felt that they had their own unique and special relationship with him. And you did. He possessed a rare combination of fierce loyalty and an eager openness. He ever sought to expand his inner circle and network of friends. When he called, he often simply asked, what's going on out there? And you knew when speaking with him that you were one of many voices and opinions that he sought. He was one of the most skilled and deliberate listeners you could ever meet. Our next speaker met Jim as a colleague in Ottawa and soon Chuck and Deb became close friends with Jim and Karen. The Honorable Chuck Strahl will now share his thoughts and lead us in prayer. Jim was my good friend. How many times in the past couple of weeks have we heard that from how many people? Jim accumulated and kept friends because he was very intentional in everything he did. Life didn't just happen to Jim. Once he decided to do something, he was all in. He was the guy who said, well, then let's do it, while the rest of us were still musing about possibilities. Being Jim's friend was something special because, like everything else he was involved with, Jim made it intentional. Jim Prentice was also very intentional about the spiritual part of his life, though, like many Canadians, he wasn't in your face about it. He was simply guided in life by faith-based principles, and he lived them day by day. Karen says that when Jim attended services at their church, he carried with him the Life Application Bible. And it's not surprising that Jim would put more emphasis on how to apply biblical teachings than, say, debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Jim always seemed to live out the expression, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And Jim seemed to care about a lot of things, but mostly he cared about a lot of people. My wife, Deb, says that uh, Jim was one of the few politicians in her experience who gave you his undivided attention when you spoke to him. There was no looking over your shoulder to see if there was someone else in the room who he just couldn't wait to talk to. Jim cared about people, which made it easy to care about Jim. Karen also told me that Jim particularly liked the writings in the Old Testament. And as his church minister suggested, perhaps that's partly because the Old Testament is filled with the law, and the law always intrigued Jim. But the Old Testament is also replete with stories about ordinary people called to do extraordinary things. It's in the Old Testament that the concept of servant leadership was first developed, where leaders didn't consider themselves greater than those they served. And that describes Jim. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been struck by the diversity of people and organizations who were moved to write and speak about Jim. The arts community, public servants, indigenous people, business leaders, environmental advocates, the Calgary Police Foundation, political friends and foes alike, his church family, the Children's Cottage Society, and many, many others. And typically, people wrote and spoke not just about the magnitude of his accomplishments, which were many, but even more so, they spoke about the content of his character. It seems that Jim made a habit of living up to the Old Testament words to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord. All of us will miss Jim, but as difficult as it has been to wrestle with his loss, we also know that it is his family who has the most grief to bear. Jim was a cherished family, a cherished member of a big family. He was a beloved brother. He was a loving and generous father and grandfather. And to Karen, he was a loving and devoted husband, a true partner in all they did and planned and built together. 
For those who have been to Jim's home office in the past couple of years, you'll have noticed that the political and business photos that once dominated the walls have gradually been replaced by pictures of family. If Jim played favorites, it was to put his family first. Karen has asked me to close my remarks with a prayer. It's appropriate, I believe, that I first read a prayer attributed to St. Francis, a prayer that is steeped in wisdom and has stood the test of time. It's a prayer that fits well with the Life Application Bible. And when I think of Jim, these words ring true. I invite you now to close your eyes and open your hearts as we pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. And now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jim's life and for those cherished memories we have, even though we find such great sorrow in losing him. We ask that you be with Karen and the family and surround them with your comfort and your love. We ask that, you would, that they would sense your presence and that you would give them a supernatural sense of peace that passeth all understanding in these difficult days that are so hard to understand and in the days to come. In your precious name we pray, amen. Thank you, Chuck. Jim Prentice was, elect, was elected as the MP, MP for what was then Calgary Centre North in 2004, thanks to the tireless work of hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers. And while his first term saw him on the opposition benches, his goal was always to play a role in government so he could be a part of affecting change. That opportunity came with the election of Canada's 22nd Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honourable Stephen Harper. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Jason. Your Honours, Lieutenant Governor Mitchell and Doug Mitchell, Premier Notley, Leader of the Opposition, Jean, Chief Justice Fraser, former Lieutenant Governor Ethel, former Prime Ministers Clark and Campbell, former Premiers Stelmack, Redford and Hancock, distinguished, so many distinguished, present and former representatives of all levels of government and of the diplomatic corps, friends, acquaintances and admirers of the Honourable Jim Prentice and, of course, Jim's family, daughters Christina, Cassie and Kate, sons-in-law John and Ryan, grandchildren Jack and Kaylee, brothers and sisters, and, of course, Karen. We have all been shocked and deeply saddened by the events that have brought us together today. But we know that nobody can feel Jim's loss more deeply than you. We've lost a colleague and a friend. You've lost so much more, girls, your father, Karen, the love of your life. Just let me say this, that I could see how deeply he loved his family. I can tell you his whole being would literally just lit, light up when he talked about the strong, successful and loving women in his life. So Karen, 
You and your family, all your family, are very much in our thoughts and prayers. And I think you are also in the hearts of so many thousands of Canadians, of Albertans, who admired Jim, who deeply respected him, and who have rushed forward in droves to say so. Let us also take a moment to acknowledge that we share our grief with those who mourn the companions of Jim who passed with him on that fateful day. We think of them all as well, and God bless all of them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I want to talk most particularly about Jim Prentice, the politician. I knew Jim by, only by reputation when he phoned me in March of 2002 to indicate that he would resign as progressive conservative by-election candidate in Calgary Southwest so that I could more easily assume the position of leader of the opposition then held by the Canadian Alliance. He said it was not an easy decision for him, but it was the right thing to do, and he hoped that I would use my position to advance the prospects of unifying the conservative movement. What Jim did was not without controversy in some circles, but what Jim did, which was the essence of the man, was to put his ambition to the service of the wider cause and of the greater public good. And from that point forward, our careers in federal politics became forever linked. Jim's act was also an important one of many that contributed to the formation of the new Conservative Party of Canada a year and a half later. And last night, a number of us, former colleagues of Jim, gathered and we talked about how that led not only to political success, but to relationships that will last a lifetime. Jim, of course, became a champion of our new United Party, and not long after, he became the Conservative Member of Parliament for Calgary Centre North, and quickly, a key member of our Shadow Cabinet. From that time forward, I dealt with Jim Prentice, the public office holder, and I can truly say that among the so many talented, decent, and hardworking people I had the honor to work with as a national leader, Jim was easily one of the most capable, always thoroughly briefed on every matter that came before us, never afraid to express a contrary view, yet never in a way unpleasant to his colleagues dedicated, knowledgeable, and respected. And let me tell you, there's a price to be paid for that. You get the tough jobs. We'll get to that. But here's the thing, when you met Jim, the politician, you met a gracious, almost patrician individual, yet accessible and down to earth. What else would you, what else would you expect from a guy born into an Ontario mining family who had worked hard harder than most for everything that he had. He put himself through university as a coal miner in the Crow's Nest Pass to become a lawyer. He earned two degrees, and so he dug coal for seven years. You would find, too, that he was a man of simple faith, as Chuck said, an active member of Grace Presbyterian Church here in Calgary. You would find that as a newly minted lawyer, he specialized in social justice cases, especially those relating to basic property rights. And of course, he built a successful firm here in town. And Jim was also a hockey player for our Conservative Party of Canada hockey team, during which, as the occasional team coach, I saw in him flashes of the form that had taken his father and his famous uncle to the NHL. But that kind of bench strength really came to the fore when we became the government of Canada. Of course, at times, it was a challenge but Jim thrived on a challenge, which brings me back to the tough jobs. To begin with, I appointed him chairman of the Cabinet's Operations Committee, which is equivalent to being the government's chief operating officer. It's a hard place to make friends. In fact, in holding colleagues' feet to the fire on issues of implementation and communications, in batting down hopeless pet projects, it is an easy position from which to make enemies. But, always coming fully prepared, Jim had a way of winning people. Pleasant without being flattering, clear without being blunt. 
I like how Stockwell Day put it. Explaining how Jim handled himself in cabinet and caucus with his colleagues, Jim said this. When Jim won, Stock said, when Jim won, he didn't gloat. When he lost, he didn't pout. Jim served Canadians in vital and difficult ministries where his principle, his pragmatism, and his sense of decency made a difference. Just to give a few examples. As Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, Jim was responsible for finalizing and implementing the Indian Residential Schools Agreement. It was an enormous job, but his efforts went beyond mere symbolism. His goal was to bring meaningful improvements to the lives of ordinary Aboriginal people, to those outside the power structures, to secure equal rights for Aboriginal women, to get accountability to on-reserve people for public funds, to obtain for them good services, clean water, to relieve the burden of dependency. Likewise, as, a, as industry minister, he sought better opportunities for innovation and growth for Canadian businesses without making them wards of the taxpayer. As environment minister, Jim took particular pride in the expansion of our national parks and major conservation initiatives. He refused to be boxed in by false claims that jobs in the energy industry had to be destroyed to advance our ecological objectives. So Jim determined that environmental policy should be pursued in a way that enhanced jobs and opportunities for Canadians and Albertans while protecting our air, land and water for generations to come. And long after he left Ottawa, he pursued this conviction in Alberta knowing as only those with roots in other regions of, the, of this country truly understand that a slowing energy industry in this province invariably weakens the entire Canadian economy. Yes, friends, we gave the hardest assignments to the people best able to handle them, and Jim was always one of those people. I'll tell you a little bit of a story. I made Jim Environment Minister just shortly before Barack Obama became president. I wanted to see us develop a comprehensive regulatory approach to energy and the environment. The Americans seemed very interested, and President Obama asked if I could send some down, someone down to Washington early on to look at the issues. I told the president, I said, Barack, I'm going to send down our new environment minister, Jim Prentice. I think you guys will like him. He's probably the most capable guy that I've got. To which President Obama said, that's great, Stephen, and I promise not to tell your other guys that you said that. <laughs> but Jim really was one of the best in intentions and in performance. And in his long public service career, he always gave Canada and Alberta his very best. That is how he deserves to be remembered. Now friends, Jim's passing reminds us all that we do not know the number of our days. We can only live the days we have with our priorities well ordered. Jim did that, he did well for his country, he did well for his colleagues and friends. He loved his family. So I say once again for Maureen and my family, God bless you, Karen, and your family, and farewell to Jim, our friend and colleague. We will remember you.
But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace It taught my heart to feel Grace my fears relieve How precious did that grace appear the hour I first be my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns an ending love He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed. God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. An ending love, amazing grace. An ending love. Amazing. Thank you to Mr. George Canyon for that touching rendition, and thank you, Prime Minister Harper. I would now like to invite someone who has been a neighbor, a confidant, and a mentor to Jim. He has been incredibly supportive of Karen and her family over the last two weeks. A philanthropist and someone who needs no introduction in this city, the Dean of Corporate Calgary, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dick Haskane. Thank you, Jason. Do you remember the Prime Minister's uh, comments about the important people here and how he welcomed them? Well, uh, I second his motion, but i also like to add our Prime Minister as well. Mr. Uh, Harper, you've been a wonderful friend and a good job for in what you said and was very sincere, I know. It's an interesting <clears throat> reason that I'm here. Well, it was mentioned that uh, we've been neighbors and we have for on Crescent Road for it's almost two decades. But the relationship, quite frankly, goes back a lot further. You should first of all <laughs> understand, I maybe don't look it, but I'm more than 20 odd years older than our wonderful friend Jim. And we had a lot in common, perhaps more than, than most people would realize. <clears throat> we both graduated from the University of Alberta in Commerce 
Uh, mind you, I was 20 years ahead of Jim. <laughs> Quite frankly, before the University of Calgary was even initiated, that was 50 years ago. So that goes back a long ways. In addition, when Karen and Jim fa finished their legal training, and they came to Calgary, that was in the early 1980s, of course, and we had just, at that time, some of you are old enough to remember the National Energy Program. And I remember it particularly well because I happened to have had a, quite a good business career up to that point. I'd been around for more than 20 years <laughs> and was president of a company called Hudson's Bay Oil and Gas. And of course, as you might imagine, we were uh, later taken over primarily as a result of the National Energy Program, how it was structured. Turned out it was the biggest takeover in Canadian history at the time, over $5 billion. So the interesting part, though, is that this young lawyer who shared these roots of mine, we're, we're both small town guys. I came from, from Gleeson, you, know, you don't know where it is, but it's just out here 60 miles. And he came from the Crow's Nest Pass. So we shared that, and we were both fairly good hockey players. The only thing that he never, I don't think, either recognized and certainly didn't accept was that uh, I was the captain of a midget team in 1948 or 49, and we beat the Coleman team, and he never forgot that. I don't know if he even knew it, but he, he didn't like to recognize it. So we go back a long ways. In addition, he even then had an interest in Aboriginal affairs, and of course, <coughs> excuse me, in my world, I'd lived most of my early life and continued there in a little town of Gleeson, which was right adjacent to Siksika Reserve. Our house was within 200 yards of the railroad track, and I spoke uh, the Blackfoot language fairly well, at least everything in the butcher shop, but I did have a reasonable command of that. And so that, plus a number of other things, who were fascinating to, to Jim in our early days. He was a very young, impressive, and intelligent fellow. And so <clears throat> I was helpful to him more as a, I think, as a, as a father image because of the age difference, the experience that I'd had in business, because Hudson Bay was a very good company, well respected. So quite frankly, he used that, and I used it in a, in a polite way, to understand more about the implications of the National Energy Program because it was critical, and he tried to understand it from a business point of view, as well as, of course, a legislative and legal point of view. So with the relationships that we had between small town people, 20 years age difference, different backgrounds, it became a common thing in his different roles in life in the political arena. And so I feel honored that I was able to provide him only when he asked, of course, about some of the issues that were so critical to our country. And he developed that in a way that we all recognize now, but it, it goes back a long ways. Because even now, at, uh, at, at age 60, which was tragic, he was working on the principles that he can clearly expresses on, whether it's the economy, energy policy, and of course, in <laughs> In later years, uh, as a former chairman of two of our big pipeline companies, uh, Enbridge and TransCanada, he used my knowledge, which was probably biased in terms of pipelines. So those and many other reasons, I had r great respect for this man. So it's much more than just, I don't mean just, than, a, than being a neighbor. It was more than that, deeper than that. And of course, the wonderful family, uh, Cassia, you did a super job. And, representing your family. I, I, well, anyway, I, I had tears in my eyes. But in any event, that is the relationship that we've enjoyed. And you try to look at the adjectives that are used. The press, I've never, I don't remember the press from across this country, and indeed broader than that, of the way it was handled and the recognition he got was simply outstanding. I was so proud of that. So I don't know what to say other than there are a few of the adjectives, I think, that come across in almost everybody's speeches. And it has to do, I guess, my favorite word for me is integrity. He has absolute integrity in everything he did. And he was so 
capable of speaking, which we all know, one of the best speakers. And uh, <laughs> it was illustrated to me one time when a good friend of mine, who's quite blunt, he would had a difference of opinion on something with respect to Jim. He didn't know him well, but so he said, Haskin, I've been talking to that friend Prentice of yours, and he said, I said, well, what do you think of him? I said, you, you disagree with him? He, he said, that guy is so damn smart, speaks so well, he can tell you where to go in such a way you look forward to the trip. <laughs> so, the, the other, <laughs> I hate to insert myself, but I do have some, I guess, inside information that I value. And, and the other one is, of course, uh, when Jim took the courageous move of moving out of the political arena and to a CIBC, I spent a reasonable amount of time with him because he was not a banker. I had spent 20 years on that bank board, CIBC. And uh, with all due respect, it probably could use some help. And he was exactly the right person to do that. And so we talked a lot about that, what the structure of the bank was, what the issues were, and on and on. And of course, he, he knew a lot, but he picked up so much, he's very, very astute in how he would handle that within this big bank structure. So I watched him in that role, and I can't believe how successful he was, number one for the bank. I mean, he did the right thing for the bank, developed customers, explained positions to people far beyond the role of, quote, just a banker. So that was outstanding for me, because this country w needs more Jim Prentices in the business world who have been in politics and then step out of that. Because you remember his issues that the Prime Minister defined. He carried that on consistently, but from the platform of a bank. And with all due respect to banks and all due respect to politicians, a person coming from both of those angles is very, very important to our country and far more influential than most people will ever realize. So of all the things I admire him for, he was very consistent and speaking from those two platforms to important people and to the average person, he was simply outstanding and we, I hate to say it, don't have many people in the country who that have, have those particular skills. So I hope that some of those messages that he's conveyed and the work that he's done will be conveyed in a way, hopefully in the book, that will, that will be there because we need that. And I know that he's worked hard at it as a Woodrow Wilson scholar and all his incredible experiences have accumulated in 60 years. So that's my hope of a lasting legacy that will be good for this whole country and we will all be proud of that and we will expand on that. Some of us, no matter how old we are, we better keep working on it because this country has its own issues to deal with. And many of the things I talked about in 1981 are here today in a different form. And so I just hope that we take this message clearly because here is a person, 60 years old, who has made such a contribution, which you all are heard and are here for. He also, in my view, has would have had 20 more years at least to contribute the way he's contributed in the past. So from the point of view of this country's point, point of view and the people, we're so fortunate to have had the 20 years or 30 years of actual working experience out, out in the, the community and he would have contributed even more in the next 20, but that's life. I just wanted to say to Karen and the girls and the whole family how much we appreciate you. We we're, we're there, we're a few steps away. We love you enormously. And Lois, unfortunately, is on the other side of the world. We're going to be there as, as long as we can make it, to Karen. <laughs> so we're going to be there to continue to do whatever we can. So I, I hope you know that sincerely. So I'm honored to have been asked to do this, and uh, I'm not uh, a great speaker, but my heart's with you, and thanks for coming.
Thank you, Mr. Haskane. During difficult times when we are challenged to the point of not knowing where to turn, it's friends that jump into the breach to see us through. In the past two week, the, the past two weeks have been truly, truly difficult. Jay and Leah Hill have been there for Karen throughout these days, and their unwavering support and kindness have been a tremendous source of comfort and strength. I invite the Honourable Jay Hill to share his thoughts about his friend Jim. I think before I start <clears throat> my prepared notes, I just want to state what, our <clears throat> what I believe all of us are thinking right now. There are no words. There are no words that can possibly describe the enormity of the loss of Jim Prentice to his family, to his friends, to his province, and to his country. Jim Prentice was my friend. He was the best kind of friend, always considerate, supportive, interested, and encouraging. Jim was also a friend to many others, hundreds in fact, as we've heard repeatedly today. How he found time in his busy life to be such a good friend to so many people from different walks of life, different segments of society, and different cultural and ethnic backgrounds is an amazing and lasting tribute to the man. The testament to this is before me today by your presence as we all come together to mourn his premature passing and to celebrate his life. His legal friends, political friends, both federal and provincial, hockey and golf buddies, and friends from all the many causes he supported. He made time for everyone, and he made us all feel special. Jim and I started off as colleagues in opposition, then fellow ministers in government, and most importantly to me, great friends after politics. The first time I remember meeting Jim was after he was elected in 2004. He was, well, he was excited, and he was very keen to make a difference. And his great reputation, of course, preceded him. And on that day, he and Karen dropped by my office. I was the opposition whip at the time, and I was responsible for assigning offices to our new MPs. Well, I'll fess up, Jim didn't get the best office. But he didn't get the worst either, although Karen has constantly reminded me since that she thinks I did give him the worst office. I still marvel at how quickly we became good friends. He obviously didn't hold a grudge about his first office on Parliament Hill. Despite his numerous accomplishments, which have been covered extensively in the press and on social media, Jim was a proud, but a very humble man. In fact, I think he would have grinned, he would have read a few of the articles, he would have chuckled over some of the journalists who may have been less than kind during his public life, but all the accolades would not have changed who he was at his core, a man who worked his life to protect and defend others. One of the editorials that resonated the most with me was entitled, If You Knew Jim Like I Knew Jim. And for many of us grieving his death, I'm sure these words summon up your own personal memories of Jim. But the one common thread is that to have really known Jim is to have respected, admired, and yes, even loved this exceptional man. Jim was my friend, but he was more than that because we'd been through the stresses 
of politics together, not once, but twice. A funny memory of Jim's humility, or maybe it was just tolerance, was many years ago when four of us couples, all federal ministers at the time, gathered for a brief winter holiday in Naples, Florida. The first three couples to arrive put dibs on the bedrooms, and when Jim and Karen were, well, they were subsequently relegated to the suite, suite, adjacent to the garage, <laughs> complete with single beds. I can tell you we were waiting for the outcry about the injustice of it all. But no, they both laughed and they jokingly argued about who got which bed. But they never let us forget that we'd made them sleep in the garage. <laughs> Shortly after Jim and I retired from politics in the fall of 2010, his retirement with considerable more fanfare, my wife Leah and I hosted a housewarming party to celebrate our move to Calgary. Of course, Jim and Karen were there. However, they could only stay an hour. Well, at about 2 a.m., they finally left. <laughs> but not before Jim had gone around and introduced himself to everybody in attendance, saying, Hi, I'm Jim, and I'm unemployed. So many great memories, and so many terrific laughs. As we all know, Jim wasn't unemployed for long, and Dick referred to this. Soon after he retired from politics, he announced he was joining CIBC as their vice chairman, a position he enjoyed, except for the time that he had to spend away from his family. By then, Jim and Karen had become grandparents to Jack, his little buddy, and his best pal. When Jack was a little older, a friend donated a train, a train set their kids had outgrown, and Jim set it up in the basement for Jack, and some of it is here today. However, it wasn't long before the small boxes from hobby shops far and wide started arriving on a regular basis, and it turns out the little boy and Jim also loved trains. In fact, when we went on holidays after Christmas last year, his first stop was the model train store. Jim had found a new passion, one that he could share with Jack, which made it all the more special. Once Jim started at CIBC, he loved to joke that in his lifetime, he'd had three occupations, a lawyer, a politician, and a banker, one of which was actually honorable. And as much as that made us laugh, there was no doubt that Jim made all three honorable. Jim and I both shared a love of good scotch and a great cigar. And while partaking, we shared many philosophical discussions and tried hard to solve the world's problems. But one conversation we had will always stand out with me. What would you think if I decided to return to politics, Jim asked me one Day. My first reaction was, are you out of your mind? But Jim responded, and I remember his words like it was yesterday. I don't want to look back on, at my children and grandchildren in a decade and know I could have done something to help Alberta, and I chose not to. And like so many others that are here today, I simply asked, Okay, how can I help? And that's the sign of a true leader. That's the effect he had on friends and complete strangers, young and old. And he had a huge youth contingent on his campaigns. Rich or poor, blue collar, white collar, or no collar. People rallied behind Jim. Without even having to ask, he put together a team that was as wonderfully diverse as Alberta is. As, been, as has been stated yet today again, Jim was also an excellent listener, constantly seeking the opinions of others. A unique trait in any politician. His art for building great loyal teams was a result of being a consensus builder. And he often tried his best 
to avoid unnecessary conflict whenever possible. This made politics somewhat an odd choice for Jim. But he believed Canadians deserved more from their leaders than sound bites and photo ops. And anyone who worked with Jim truly appreciated the calm, intelligent, respectful nature he brought to every meeting, every gathering, every boardroom, and every hockey rink. And of course, his eternal optimism, which never dimmed regardless of the challenge or the setbacks he had to endure. I could go on for hours or days sharing my memories of Jim and my absolute awe at what he accomplished. But Jim would always say the best part of his life was his family. Karen, always at his side, his best friend, and truly the love of his life. Their beautiful daughters, Christina, Cassie, and Kate, the son-in-laws, John and Ryan, you all meant the world to him, and he never tired of telling us. And of course, his grandchildren, his amazing Jack, and Kaylee, his beautiful wee granddaughter, who always found a way to make her grandpa smile. And I'd like to especially thank Kaylee and her friend Bob Smith for giving us reason to laugh through our tears over the past two weeks. And finally, if there is a St. Andrews in heaven, and I'm pretty sure there is, I suspect Jim and Ken put together a foursome and they're teeing off for another round right about now. Jim Prentice was my friend, our friend. Rest in peace. We will never forget you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. As has been said here today, Jim Prentice had a, an incredible sense of what is right, and that guided him in the most difficult decisions of his life. And he led by doing what was right, even if it wasn't always the most popular way of thinking at the time. At the start of his career, he fought for the protection of an environmentally sensitive area in southern Alberta known as the Whaleback. He stood shoulder to shoulder with the Sikh community in Calgary to achieve the, first, the building of the first gurwar in the city. In federal politics, he stood up for same-sex marriage and he worked towards reconciliation with our indigenous peoples, helping to achieve the residential school settlement. As premier, he wanted Albertans to be prepared for the impending economic challenges that, challenges that we now face. So he told us the truth, regardless of the political consequence. Almost exactly a year ago, it was Jim Prentice, Jim Prentice who stood right here as we mourn the tragic loss of another great leader, another great friend, a great Canadian, Manmeet Singh Buller. They shared an absolute commitment to the call of public service. The loss of these two men leaves an incredible gap for their families, for Alberta, and indeed, for our whole nation. It has truly been a difficult year. But while that gap may now seem impossible to fill, it should be seen as a calling, a challenge for us all to meet. Jim always challenged himself and those around him. He continually sought to learn and to be enlightened. He wasn't afraid to change his mind and did not see the evolution of thought as a sign of weakness. Ultimately, what we can learn from the life of Jim Prentice is with every opportunity, 
every success, every blessing that you realize in life, whether with your family or in your profession, view it not as a personal accomplishment, but rather view it as a duty to give back. Give back to your neighbors, give back to your communities, give back to your province, give back to your country, give back to your friends, and give back to your family. On behalf of the, of the Prentice family, thank you so much for being here today. It truly means so much. I will now invite the Reverend Jean Morris to give a benediction. Following her words, there will be a photo tribute, and then we invite you to the reception in the lobby where we hope you will stay and visit and share your memories of Jim. Reverend Morris. Jim Prentice had a profound sense of call from God to serve people. He could see a vision of what could be made better, and he did his best to try to make that vision a reality. Jim believed each one of us is called to use our gifts to serve the common good. While we do not understand the tragedies of life, God gives us a vision of hope of a time where death will be no more, where mourning and crying and pain will be no more. We have hope that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and we have opportunity to support those who mourn. We give thanks for the life of Jim and all that was accomplished through his energy, wisdom, commitment to justice, and the love he gave away, all gifts from God given to Jim. In a spirit of thanksgiving today, in the midst of our sorrow, we commend Peter, Eric, James Prentice, Jim, to the everlasting care of God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend your servant Jim, Receive your Son into your presence of everlasting peace and into the company of the saints in light. Friends, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace now and forever. Amen. <laughs>